welcome to the Beyond Barriers podcast. If you're an ambitious woman who wants to dominate your career, then you are in the right place. This podcast is co-hosted by Nikki Barua, digital innovator, serial entrepreneur, author, and speaker. And Monica Marquez, ex-Googler, diversity expert, and senior corporate leader. From inspiring stories to cutting-edge strategies, you'll learn how to develop the skill set, mindset, and tool set to get future ready fast and accelerate your success. Welcome to the Beyond Barriers podcast. I'm your host, Monica Marquez. If I were to go online right now and review your professional profile, would I be able to understand who you are beyond your job? Would I know your brand, your values, and your story? Well, in this episode, you will meet with Jai Vargas, who is the founder of The Latinista, a national network for Latinas and women of color invested in professional development and career mobility. She's also called the LinkedIn Ninja and hosts workshops to help individuals harness the power of the platform. Jai is also a career and diversity strategist where she helps organizations develop engaging programming focused on career and leadership development. With a background in multicultural marketing and communications, Jai is a natural born community builder and an expert networker. She has led the Financial Women's Association Emerging Leaders Network of New York, has worked to develop money investing workshops for women with Elevest, featured in Maker's Money, spoken on Yahoo Finance, featured in Forbes for her work on Latina Equal Pay Day, and works in partnership with organizations like Luminary, We NYC, and the Financial Gym. Visit imbeyondbarriers.com where you'll find show notes and links to all the resources referenced in this episode, including the best way to get in touch with Jai. Welcome, Jai. Thank you so much for joining us here at the Beyond Barriers podcast. We are so excited to have you here and for you to share your pearls of wisdom with our listeners. So let's dive right in and tell us your story and tell us a little bit of, you know, lifelong lessons you've learned along the journey and um, <clears throat> what it is that you do. Thank you so much for having me. Well, the short story is I spent about 15 years in corporate America. I studied advertising and marketing communications here mm -hmm. in New York City. And while in corporate America, I did a lot of work around multicultural marketing and strategy, and then eventually diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. About two years ago, I decided to jump out into the entrepreneurial world <laughs> to do exactly what I was doing in corporate, but as a consultant. Uh -huh. I saw the opportunity because I came from a world within a large corporation that had the resources, um, the tools, the education, mm -hmm. and the planning behind it to be successful. But I was getting a lot of insight and interest from other organizations that didn't necessarily have mm -hmm. those subject matter experts internally to help them come across as a diverse, uh, equitable, and inclusive organizations. And so mm -hmm. I said, hmm, instead of doing this for just one company, I can have multiple clients and <laughs> I can actually be in some fun industries instead of just mm, life insurance. <laughs> Nice. Yeah. So I can certainly relate to that. I think you and I have had par parallel paths in that regard. Um, so <clears throat> it does take a little bit of, you know, courage to really decide and switch lanes and, um, you know, go from different industries and like you said, jump from corporate to um, kind of going solo um, in entrepreneurial ways. What helped you make those decisions and what gave you the courage to do it? Yeah, you know, um, throughout my career trajectory, I was always in a different industry. So I actually started in my favorite one, which is the automotive industry. Mm -hmm. And then I went into the sports industry. Mm -hmm. I worked a little bit in the pharmaceutical. And then I was finally in financial services for about nine years at my mm -hmm. last corporate stint. Mm -hmm. And throughout that entire time, I kept asking myself and doubting as well, saying, how in the world am I going to transition my skills into the sports industry? I knew nothing about sports mm -hmm. and then financial services and then pharmaceuticals. Automotive, I knew a lot of, mm -hmm. but then I started focusing and saying, well, it's not necessarily about the industry that I need to be a subject matter expert in. It's the marketing, the diversity and the mm -hmm. multicultural strategies that I've been studying and learning. Mm -hmm. And so articulating the fact that I could apply everything that I was learning in that industry to mm -hmm. any of these corporate spaces was what I focused on. 
Mm. Um, and then so making the jump from corporate America to entrepreneurship was actually a more bold move. Mm-hmm. But the number one thing that I knew I had to do before jumping is having a financial strategy in place. Mm-hmm. So I was very sure as to where my money was, what it could do for me, mm-hmm. and also how to make sure it didn't run out while I'm an entrepreneur. So I obviously got a coach and a expert mm-hmm. to help me with my money. Uh, I knew that I wasn't capable of figuring it all out by myself. That's fantastic advice in terms of not trying to figure it out all by yourself and really uh, planning and um, taking an assessment. It sounds like you took an assessment of what are your, you know, what are your strengths? What are your skills? What are the things that you can take? And I think the key thing is those transferable skills that you were able to take from industry to industry, role to role, and really capitalize on those. Um, <clears throat> What helped you hone your unique strengths and skills? Like, was it different assignments or was it partly some of those experiences jumping from place to place? You know, I think something that worked in my favor during corporate America time was the fact that I was interacting with different, not only departments, but specific allies and communities within. Mm -hmm. And so you and I have a similar background and we've been part of, and I've also led many employee resource groups. Mm -hmm. And within those groups, I got the ability to lead and to develop strategy. Mm. And so it became clearer as to what type of skills and characteristics and superpowers I had. Mm -hmm. You know, with every program I was designing or delegating or executing, I started saying, hey, I'm actually pretty good at this. I (laughs) can do this every quarter. You know what? I think I can do this every month. You know what? I think I can do this every week. Mm. Um, And over the course of 15 years, being engaged and researching and having others help me do so really allowed for me to say, I really love doing this type of work and I don't know how to do this, but let me learn it or let me partner up with someone else who's going to make this successful. Mm. So I really think that I did a lot of introspective work and I had a wonderful opportunity at some organizations that just said, you want to do this? Here's the ball, run with it. Right. So all it took was for you to ask, right? And they said, okay. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And I was, I was really in a thriving community because there were so many people that saw the opportunity as well to make mm-hmm. a leadership role uh, within. Um, so they too wanted to step up to the plate and we would help each other. And I'd say, all right, I'm going to build the strategy and the communications. You're going to do the internal social media. You're going to collect all of the headshots. What's the program going to look like? Who's securing the room and ordering the food? Mm -hmm. What's the agenda? Let's roll. And once you do that a couple dozen times, you become an expert. It's really a simple formula. (laughs) So I just said, oh, I can do this. That's incredible. So you systematized it and and tapped into your your community and your network, um, which which brings me to you learned really quickly how to tap into the resources of your community and to the network. Can you share for our listeners? You know, maybe did you ever have any hesitation on tapping or asking your community for help? I know a lot of people sometimes associate the idea of networking as something. Um, a dirty word almost of kind of like, oh, I don't like to network. I don't like to make it feel like I'm out looking for something or like what it is that you can do for me. Uh, What helped you get over that? And and what, you know, what really helped you tap into that just amazing resource of, of, um, of help? Mm -hmm. You know, I started, and I hear that a lot, a lot of people don't like networking because they always feel like they're asking for something Mm -hmm. or they're being needy or perhaps it's a one-way street when it's a mentee-mentor relationship. Mm -hmm. And so what I started to do is ask myself, well, what kind of essential values do I bring? What can I offer someone so that it doesn't always seem like I'm the one asking? Mm -hmm. And so I started to get really clear on what I could give to someone, whether Mm -hmm. it was a connection for a better job opportunity or help on PowerPoint or Canva Mm -hmm. or simply teaching them how to be a confident public speaker when speaking in front of one person or 500 people. I knew that I had a pretty good grasp of what I had to offer someone. And it was those common things that people kept asking me for because they knew Mm -hmm. 
with. And so before asking someone for something, I would always offer first. So then, you know, it starts to build into the fact that reciprocity makes this whole world go round. Mm -hmm. One day you're going to need something from me and I'm going to need something from you. And as long as we always keep each other, um, you know, first and foremost valuable and respectful in our relationships, it doesn't feel one-sided. And so I just love that. And for me, it takes seconds and moments to say, oh, I ran across this article or this book or this conference that you might be interested in. I'm going to send it to you. I'm not even looking for acknowledgement or even a reply. Mm -hmm. I, I don't need you to reply. But my mind works in a way that a Rolodex does. So Mm -hmm. I start learning what makes you passionate about what you do. And every time I come across an article or a person or a book or a conference that resonates with what you're interested in, I send it to you. Mm. Um, And that's very powerful and it takes seconds. And so that's what I've built my relationships on. Mm -hmm. Everyone's like, wow, you're so full of value. You're always sending me things. You're always thinking of me. And for me, it's so easy. I mean, I I put people in these buckets of they're interested in corporate talent acquisition or diversity or mindfulness or wellness. Mm -hmm. I even have lists of people and their interests to remind Mm me. Wow. um, I just love doing that for people. And and then they reciprocate with sending me clients, opportunities, uh, women for my community, uh, potential jobs. Mm. It's just, for me, it makes the world go round. (laughs) That's a phenomenal habit of, of it's, it's the simple things. It's the simple things of staying connected. And like you said, not really looking for a particular outcome, just doing it. And it's a, it's a, I guess, a practice that has become a habit for you. And it pays off in the end of just, you know, the, the, uh, their willingness to also keep you top of mind. Mm-hmm. That's, that's an excellent, excellent um, idea. Now, in your experience, you've been, um, you know, you again, and, and I don't know if you shared with us yet, but I would love for you to share with us. You founded an organization, the Latinista, um, which is a national network for Latina women who um, are looking to or invested in really kind of just um, always getting better and developing themselves and career mobility. Um, Out of curiosity, what are some of the patterns you've observed that prevent women and more specifically our Latina sisters, our, our, you know, our our women of color uh, sisters to show up with confidence and really own um, their successes? Yeah. So, you know, I started this group eight years ago Mm -hmm. and I really started it because I saw that my friends and my community weren't necessarily in the conversations that I was in that were making me a better productive employee. Mm -hmm. So I'd ask them like, wow, how come you weren't at that large event speaking on women empowerment? You know, here in New York, it's a pretty small community. And so you're pretty much always in the know when it comes to these large Mm -hmm. events. And I noticed that the women in my community didn't even have a clue as to what was going on and they were being left behind, Mm -hmm. not only in the conversations, but in the career opportunities, as well as the simple technologies that they Mm -hmm. needed to stay on top of. And so a lot of times, I think one of the most common things that I see when women come to the organization is the fact that they are not necessarily self um, reliant on their skills Mm. or they're not necessarily so sure that they can do a particular job to the best of their knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so I always tell them, perhaps you don't have the time, the energy or the money to go back to school, but there are so many resources either on YouTube or on my platform or on any of these social media sites to learn something new and get better. Mm-hmm. Right, And it could be something so simple as learning how to drive productive meetings or using this project management tool that's going to take your department of two or three people or one person to mm-hmm. a whole other level. And so I see a lot of women that don't apply to opportunities they'd love to be in, but they say, oh gosh, I don't think that I've learned enough to be able to apply to that when we've heard tons of times that men apply even with just having 30% <laughs> of 
of right. the knowledge inside or education background or information or degrees. Right. Um, and it's just about being bold. Um, of course, you have to be able to back it up and know your information. Mm-hmm. But if you feel that this is an opportunity that you could thrive in, mm-hmm. that you are well-versed in, you should have a conversation with someone who's already doing that type of work and have a real honest conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, Sometimes we need a little bit of work before we can apply to those opportunities. I get a lot of women that reach out to me and say, hey, Jai, I'd love to be a consultant too in diversity and inclusion. I'm a champion as well. I want to apply for this job, you know, at X company. And then I start having conversations about some of the meat and potatoes of mm-hmm. diversity, equity, inclusion, and unconscious bias. And they're not necessarily up to speed on mm-hmm. every component or even the least bit of the insights, conferences, information, the books, the articles, the challenges, the nuances Mm -hmm. of this world. Mm -hmm. If you're sitting in front of someone who's going to interview you, they're going to see right through this. Even in just the basic three questions I asked you, Mm -hmm. maybe you should go get a certification. Absolutely. And then Mm -hmm. you can say, I'm learning and I'm working up to it, but don't jump in there and then get declined and then be bummed about it. <laughs> no, absolutely. And let's dig into that a little bit about, about it. You know, like you said, have the courage, you know, do your homework, go out there. But if you do get the no and you're bummed about it, um, how do you learn from that failure? So can you share with us or, you know, share with our audience, how do you deal with and learn from failures or setbacks? Yeah. So something that I started doing two years ago when I became an entrepreneur was surrounding myself with other consultants and mentors and entrepreneurs who've already been down this road. Mm -hmm. So an opportunity would come up and I'd say, Ooh, I sent this proposal, but Oh gosh, they told me right away that I didn't get it. What am I doing wrong? And when I would present it to my mentor or to another consultant that's in this same space, Mm -hmm. they would say, Oh, you know, you missed a huge opportunity. First of all, you didn't ask them what their challenges were, what their current programming was all about. You know, these are just various examples. Mm -hmm. I started learning that there's an entire strategy that I need to have with each interaction or proposal that is going out there. Mm -hmm. So mistakes really taught me how to present a better product and service. And, um, I work pretty efficiently. So in my first year as an entrepreneur, I probably sent out 415 proposals and I tracked them all Mm -hmm. meticulously in my (laughs) drive. Uh I have so many details and I have so much productivity efficiency tools that I use that you can start to see where the needle is moving and what some challenges that I'm having and in which particular industry. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I definitely learned a lot. (laughs) That's a fantastic tip. Tell me a little bit about um, <clears throat> how, do you, how do you remain agile? So in this current environment, as we all know, we're struggling right now with the coronavirus. Um, you're a consultant. A lot of the organizations you work with are also in kind of, you know, this limbo hiatus. Everybody's working from home, canceling events. You drive a lot of events. Um, what has helped you stay ahead of the curve? Oh, technology. I tell people all the time, you really need to sit down and figure out what you know and don't know about technology. I'll give you an example. I was supposed to host an event on the 11th of March, Mm -hmm. just recently, for Women's History Month, Mm -hmm. particularly on productivity. Uh, It was supposed to be at HBO, an incredible Mm -hmm. venue. I had tons of people already registered, and because of coronavirus, the entire building was shut down. And the day Mm -hmm. before my event, I needed to transition. And so because of the fact that I'm always on technology and communicating with other entrepreneurs that are being so efficient with their Mm -hmm. strategies and their services and their time, I already knew I've got to make this into a webinar. Everybody's going to be home. I'm not going to give them their money back because they paid for a service and a product. And Mm -hmm. I still want to help them because I see that it's valuable. Mm -hmm. Overnight, I had a webinar created and produced, and it helped me not only because I was starting to work with people in one particular space in New York City, but now Mm -hmm. it's global. Now somebody in Switzerland just bought my webinar. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and so just being knowledgeable about different products and tools that can help you be more efficient has turned my world completely right side up. It's incredible. <laughs> that is incredible. Congratulations on being so agile and be able to just like move with the, you know, whichever the, the waves were crashing, you were like, okay, I'm just gonna, I'm going to go along with it, right? Don't, instead yeah. of fighting against it. Yeah. And you know what? I, um, people ask me all the time, well, Jai, oh, you're so good at technology. Um, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do anything with social media. Okay. Then hire someone. It doesn't have to be you. Right. You should know how to drive it as well in case that other person leaves you, but go ahead and hire someone. There are so many platforms like Fiverr and mm -hmm. Upwork where you can hire a virtual assistant that is an expert in creating these tools. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do it. You should know it, but someone else can help you be productive. And it's going to cost you way less than you sitting in front of a computer for six hours trying to figure out a template. That's excellent advice around outsourcing. I think um, sometimes we are trying to figure it out all on our own, trying to do it ourselves, and the easiest thing would be to outsource it. Um, and so, you know, thinking about that and thinking about, you know, your idea of how do you be more productive, um, how do you manage competing priorities between like personal, professional goals? And um, given that now everyone is working from home, um, how do you draw those boundaries so that they're, you know, you don't kind of blur that, that fine line between professional and personal? Uh, and it's easy to do, right? Because when you're an entrepreneur and a proposal needs to go out on mm -hmm. Monday, you're working all weekend. Sometimes you don't have that, um, that flexibility to say, I'm only going to work Monday through Friday from nine to five. Sometimes I sit at the computer for about 14 hours, but then the next day I'm at uh, you know, a spa all day long. <laughs> So I've got that work-life balance to some extent, um, but I use an incredible productivity tool called Trello, mm. T-R-E-L-L-O. I use the free version, mm -hmm. and it really works as a to-do list mm -hmm. on a website. And so I have different verticals mm -hmm. on my computer in this website that says, you know, prospects I need to reach out to, completed items money in from this month, invoices I need to follow up on, recent connections and contacts that I just had a conversation with, mm -hmm. research on women in the workplace. So it's literally just a digital workbook. Mm -hmm. And every time I have a conversation with someone, say an organization calls me, but I can't remember her name and I know the organization, I can type it in, it'll pull up that template mm -hmm. and I can start adding more content to that person's tile. Um, it's been incredible because it eliminates the fact that you have to find all these emails that could have been a different subject and you don't even know who the right contact is for what department. Mm -hmm. um, and so that really helps me. I'm very diligent about making sure that my to-do list is up to date. And mm -hmm. then as soon as I finish something, I just move over the little tiles and it's phenomenal. Um, so that really helps me. That sounds fantastic. I'm I'm a novice with Trello. I'm learning it, but I'm learning how valuable it is, and um, and it's so much fun to like mark something complete and move it over. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, it almost gamifies the whole process of like, hey, I'm going to make all these tasks, and then I get this little reward by being able to tick it off and move it, slide it to the right. So that's that's really wonderful. That's sure really great can. advice. And you can add people to mm -hmm. this program. And so I have a webmaster who does all of the work on my websites. Mm -hmm. We don't ever have to have a conversation. She's part of my, my blocks mm -hmm. with Trello. And every time I add something on there, I tag her. She sees that I uploaded a picture and where it needs to go on my website. It's done. I hate conversations. I don't like being on the phone for uh, an incredible amount of time to just kind of like hang out and brainstorm. Mm -hmm. So for me, efficiency is everything. I don't spend one second out of bounds. That's amazing. Um, shifting gears a little bit. Uh, so you are a uh, the self-proclaimed and and actually you live up to the name the the LinkedIn Ninja, right? LinkedIn Ninja. Um, Tell our listeners, what is the most, I guess, common, um, maybe not mistake, but, you know, I'm sure most people aren't getting 
the most out of LinkedIn or what they should be doing with their profiles. What is one um, tidbit or one kind of recommendation you can tell everybody that they should be doing with their LinkedIn profile? So many things I see people doing uh, on a pretty consistent basis that aren't working in their favor. Mm -hmm. Number one is not keeping your LinkedIn profile up to date because Mm. when you do need your LinkedIn community, uh, whether you're looking for a new opportunity or looking to brand yourself as a thought leader, you need to have already built the community or else you're not going to have engagement or access to someone who's going to help you get a job. Mm -hmm. The misconception with LinkedIn still lies in others thinking, oh, well, I'm only on LinkedIn if I'm looking for a job. I've been at this job for 15 years and so I'm fine, right? Until you're not. And then you're like, oh my goodness, what do I do? I need to find a job. And you're like, oh, now we're going to spend three hours Mm -hmm. telling your story, updating all of your experience, connecting with people that you used to work with and figuring out what you're a subject matter expert or a thought leader in so that people can then understand who you are as an individual and as a professional brand. That Mm -hmm. takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. And if you have to do it all at once, it's really stressful. (laughs) Right. Absolutely. And so there's so many things. Um, People also think that LinkedIn is just basically a copy and paste of their resume when it's not. LinkedIn actually works as a very diverse, very colorful, very transparent platform where you Mm -hmm. can say, yes, I'm an accountant at X company, but I also bake on the side and I give Zumba lessons. And this Mm. is why it all makes sense for my personal and professional story. So whenever I meet someone in person, I hear all these wonderful things about what they're passionate about. And then I go look them up on LinkedIn and I'm like, oh, wait, she's a nurse. This must not be her. This isn't the person I met. No way. And then they're like, oh Mm -hmm. yeah, that's me. But I only keep professional things on there because I want to make sure that people don't think I'm all over the place with all these things I love to do like Zumba and baking. Like, yeah, that's not, that doesn't do any favors for you because you you seem very uh, standoffish on this Mm -hmm. profile. And in person, you're so rich and diverse and colorful and wonderful. (laughs) I want to be able to send you more clients or send you more good vibes because of what I'm reading off of this website. Mm -hmm. That's important. Absolutely. So many things. Tell me a little bit about, so um, like you said, sometimes they don't have a really strong LinkedIn social presence. um, And then they're, you know, in a hurry or trying to like kind of microwave their network um, in terms of like gaining connections and things like that. What has helped you gain access or proximity to influential leaders, you know, and building out your extremely powerful network on LinkedIn and also just in, in person? Yeah. Oh gosh. I'll give you an example. So 11 years ago, when I was looking to transition from one organization to the next, Mm -hmm. I thought to myself, one day I want to be a chief diversity officer or a chief marketing officer. Mm -hmm. And then I thought to myself, well, if I one day want to be like them, I think my network and my connections should embody everything that they are. Mm -hmm. And so why shouldn't I be connected with these individuals that I one day want to emulate? Mm -hmm. And so I printed out the Fortune 100 list. I created a Google Excel document. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Again, I went one through 100, everything from Amazon to IBM to Target to Toyota to Xerox. Mm -hmm. In the second column was their name, their title, goes next, Mm -hmm. their LinkedIn profile, and when I reached out to them and if they ever replied. Mm. And so when I did that, probably 10 or 11 years ago now, out of the 100 people on that Fortune 100 list that was either a chief diversity officer or a chief marketing officer, I met with 33 of them. Wow. And it helped me create such a powerful network of people that were of like-minded interests in diversity Mm -hmm. or marketing. Uh, And that was really powerful for me because then I was learning what conferences they were attending, what books they were reading, what they were posting, which helped me then say, I need to be at that conference. I want to read that book. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is the article they just posted. I wanted to think just like they were thinking. Um, And it's helped me create an incredible network of people that had like 
minded interests. That's brilliant. And tell me, did you, you know, hesitate when you were about to reach out to this person you didn't know who was more senior than you? Or, you know, sometimes you have that self-limiting belief that, oh, they're not going to like want to give me any time. How did you get over that? And how did you do it? You know, I don't know what made me so brave, but I wasn't worried. Um, Clearly, a ton of them didn't reply at all. Um, and some of them did. And I created some incredible relationships with these people that were way beyond my years. Mm -hmm. And so as they started replying and I got more specific in my ask, can we meet or email or video conference or just a phone call? I have four questions for you. And then in a month, can I let you know what actually came of this information and advice? Mm -hmm. Right. And Solidifying those relationships was everything. A lot of people that I teach this formula to these days, they have a hard time wrapping their minds around, oh my goodness, I'm going to reach out to someone who's like the chief marketing officer at like this huge company. What if they don't reply? Well, so what? You have Mm. 99 other people to message. Get on it. (laughs) (laughs) And the ones that do reply, those are the ones that you're going to start to build a connection with. I love that. And you focused on the 33 who said yes, and that you were able to build relationships with. Now, you, you mentioned something that really kind of str- sparked my curiosity. You said you got specific with the ask, which is important. You, you basically were asking them something. You had four questions. And then you said, I'm going to follow up with you in a month and let you know what came of it. What is that strategy and how has it helped you? That is the most important part of the formula. And I started creating that formula because I was a mentor to so many mentees Mm -hmm. in school, in the colleges and universities here in New York City. And what was making me so upset was I was spending time, money, and energy with these mentees, Mm -hmm. giving them so many pieces of advice and pearls of wisdom, and then I would never hear from them again. And then they call me (laughs) seven months and they're like, hey, Jai, let's go grab some lunch. You know, I want to know what you're up to and I want to pick your brain. I was like, oh, no, I don't think so. Uh Uh-uh, no. Mm, Right. (laughs) So for me, I said, with my interactions, I want to let them know that their advice isn't falling on deaf ears and that I'm going to go buy that book. I'm going to go reach out to Bob at this company. I went to that conference. Um, I read this article And their advice is actually being used. I'm not using them. I'm letting them know I'm being so responsible with what they're giving me. And that's Mm. so important because of all of the mentor relationships that I've had with my mentees. I'm like, don't waste my time. I'm not here to like hang out with you, give you all of this advice that is very valuable. And then you don't do anything with it. And then seven months later, you want to hear it again? I don't think so. (laughs) That is Wonderful in terms of because I think we're all driven about ROI, return on investment. And when you do give somebody the time to mentor them, to help them out, to do, you know, to share with them, then, you know, you do want to know was, you know, what's the return on investment on that? And and not that, you know, we would stop mentoring or whatever because of that. But I think what you're doing is you're giving them it's almost kind of like a gift of letting them know that your information, your advice, your pearls of wisdom, your time was, was spent very, very well. And I'm letting you know what the return on investment was. I think that is fantastic and a terrific yeah. habit that everybody should, should uh, take on. It's valuable. Let's shift some gears. I'd like to uh, ask you, who is one powerful and influ- influential person that you admire and you would love to learn from? Oh, gosh, so many. I mean, probably most of the women that I know would talk about Oprah, Uh right? And some of these business moguls that have been able to transition their careers from actress to singer to businesswoman, like Uh J-Lo. And so many influential women that are not necessarily recognized who have studied in fields like STEM or have gotten PhDs in mathematics, but aren't really um, being noticed. Mm -hmm. And so there's so many women that I surround myself with that I get so much inspiration from. And for me, I think it's primarily women who've been able to figure out 
how to do those career pivots, Mm -hmm. um, even when they're faced with challenges of maybe raising a family or having been laid off. Mm -hmm. Um, They're quick on their feet. They know to reach out to someone for help, and then they can build a strategy overnight. And it's not perfect, but they're like, you know, brush it off. Let's go. I (laughs) got people that are going to help me figure out how to build a website, or I'm going to find someone to pay to build it. Mm -hmm. Not spending too much time uh, down out, down and out on their luck, and just being resilient. Mm -hmm. And so many of those women around me, Mm -hmm. I admire them. Yes, that's amazing, and I think it's the agility and the, um, like you said. It, it doesn't have to be perfect. They're, they're not hesitating and they're just kind of moving along and putting something out there and iterating and um, kind of forging a path, right? They're pioneering and they're, they're kind of leading the way. And I think most importantly is making sure that they are bringing others along with them. So I think that's the most um, important part. part. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> I guess in closing, we tend to ask all of our um, all of our guests of what is the one key thing that you want to uh, share with our listeners in terms of continuing to accelerate their success. What is the one habit or hack that you feel um, helps you stay ahead, and what should they do to continue to stay ahead, especially in this current environment? Ooh, I think I would mention developing a personal board of directors. Mm. And a personal board of directors is a group of about five or six of your close colleagues, friends, or community that have a unique interest in something that you're not great in. Mm. And they're put in place whenever you have a big decision to make that you don't want to make on your own. Mm Mm-hmm. And so when I was transitioning from corporate America to entrepreneur, I sat down with my board of directors and one of them was in accounting. And I sat down with her and I said, here's all my money, Mm -hmm. everything that I'm working with. Do you think it's viable? Am I making a crazy decision or, you know, what should I do to prepare to jump Mm -hmm. decision? You know, you can have someone who's a great energy healer. Mm -hmm. I have tons of people in my network that are focused on mindfulness, wellness, and energy. Mm -hmm. And when you're making such a drastic change in your life, whether it's raising a family or pivoting from corporate to entrepreneurship or back into the workplace or being a veteran, you need a lot of good vibes, a Mm -hmm. lot of mental health to be able to say, (laughs) I'm making the right decision. I have the right people next to me supporting me. Let's do this and cut out all of the negativity. You need Mm -hmm. someone to help you through those uh, questions. Um, I also surrounded myself with people who have been in this position before, Mm -hmm. have taken that leap and can advise me on some of the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead. Mm -hmm. Um, You can also have someone that helps you with your physical challenges, Mm -hmm. have them saying, you know what, Uh, maybe you need healthcare. Perhaps it's not a good idea for you to become an entrepreneur right now. Or you know what, being an entrepreneur, you can sit at your desk for 16 hours. You've got to sign up for a gym now, now that you're not going to be commuting and Mm -hmm. walking 20 blocks in New York City and (laughs) keeping your sort of physical and mental stability in check. And Mm -hmm. so many other types of people that you can have around your table that will help you make those big decisions. You don't just need cheerleaders or champions. You need people that are strategic, Mm -hmm. that have been down this road before, and that can be unbiased Mm. and say, um, in your position, these are your options. Let's talk through it. Not if I were you, I would do this. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that really are clear about what they're sharing with you and not imposing what they would do. Mm. So in essence, this is um, kind of an extension or maybe a, the inner circle of your broader network or community. And you're always tapping these five people uh, to be honest and, and open with you because you are being very vulnerable with these individuals um, and expecting them to, you know, tell you the truth, even if it stings a little bit. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I have, um, I have a personal board of directors um, in many aspects of my life, but for my business one, I have individuals that I speak to all day long on chat, never on the phone, but on mm-hmm. chat where I can share, 
hey, I'm about to send this proposal. Can you review it really quick for any typos? Or can you understand what it is that I'm pitching? Mm -hmm. Or what is it that I'm missing? Or how would you articulate this? Or, hey, I have a really big challenge with a client of mine who's really upset. Can you Mm -hmm. help me through this? Um, And having people in your court and in your network that have done this type of work before helps because mm. if you were to share some of these challenges with your best friend who does work that's not even close to this they're going to be like oh I'm, I'm sure it's going to be okay it looks good mm-hmm. they're not going to tell you anything constructive <laughs> <laughs> and so does your board of directors do they does it change or does it stay the same um it's stayed the same over the last two years Mm -hmm. um but i always meet some incredible people that i tap on not every single day but maybe Mm -hmm. once in a while okay um so yeah and it's also being very clear in creating that you're not filling it up with just a bunch of friends Mm -hmm. you want to make sure that you're being very strategic and Mm -hmm. that you benefit one another you also don't want to be the one that's so needy and so um requesting of their time and their energy all the time Mm -hmm. and they can't run anything across by you because it doesn't even resonate with the type of work that they're doing so it's, it's, it's got to be um, very on brand. Mm-hmm. I love that very on brand because you have built a brand for yourself and you need to make sure that the individuals in your, on your board of directors um, are familiar with that brand or, and are helping you stay on brand because sometimes, you know, you can, <laughs> we can take a detour and they're the ones who help you kind of navigate, you know, get you back on on oh, pointing in the right direction they need to be on brand with uh your ethics and your values as well i mean i get requests from women across the country who want to do work with me mm-hmm. um and i'm very thorough with my research right the first mm-hmm. thing i ask for is their linkedin and then i go into their instagram and then i go onto their facebook and then i look at their website and then i look at what programs they have and if they're on instagram showing their boobs on top of me <laughs> Uh-huh. You better believe that I'm going to be like, no, thank you. It's yeah. just not on brand with who I am. Um, and nobody will ever see me in a picture with you next to me on any panel or any event. No, mm-hmm. not at all. That's extremely important because I think sometimes people, um, they, they're they not thoughtful in that way of <clears throat> who you surround yourself with, right? Um, and so it is really important to make sure that you do set boundaries and you don't cross those boundaries. And um, to preserve, you know, your brand and your reputation, because it just takes, like you said, a picture that may get misinterpreted to kind of bring all of that tumbling down. So absolutely, absolutely. It's, um, you know, and a lot of people are like, oh, well, I'm just being my authentic self. I'm being very transparent. And that's why people gravitate towards me. I'm like, that's great. Good for you. (laughs) You have your own tribe. (laughs) That's wonderful. I'm glad it's working for you. Again, we're not working together. (laughs) Wonderful. So again, Jai, thank you so much for all of the time. I think you've shared some fantastic tips and takeaways and habits and hacks that our listeners are going to be able to uh, put into place for themselves. And most importantly, I'm sure that, you know, they're going to be curious on how they get more Um, how they they get some more wonderful information from Jai. So what is the best way for our listeners to connect with you? I'm all over LinkedIn. So Mm -hmm. you can reach out to me on there, Jai Vargas. And I have my own website as well, Mm jaivargas.com. And if you want to join the Latinas and Women of Color community where we get together every month to learn Mm -hmm. a new tool, it's thelatinista.com. Amazing. Again, thank you so much. And we appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thanks for listening. There are thousands of podcasts out there, and we are so grateful that you've chosen to listen to ours. Visit IamBeyondBarriers.com, where you'll find show notes and links to all the resources referenced in this episode. And be sure to take the quiz on the website. Your score will tell you where you are, what helps you gain momentum, and what holds you back. You'll also get a free guide with cutting-edge career strategies. We'd also love to hear from you. Share your comments and topic suggestions on IamBeyondBarriers.com and we'll be sure to address them in future episodes. If you enjoyed our show today, please subscribe and rate the podcast or just tell a friend about it. See you next episode.